This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Green Pulse, a podcast series by The Straits Times where we analyze the beats of the changing environment from biodiversity conservation to climate change. Hi, I'm Audrey Tan and I cover science and environment for The Straits Times. My co-host is David Pogarty. Hi, I'm David and I'm the climate change editor at The Straits Times. Plastic pollution is everywhere. Every year, millions of tons of it ends up in the ocean. From plastic bags to bottles, cigarette lighters to fishing nets, and even flip-flops, the trash fouls beaches, kills seabirds and marine animals, and creates vast garbage patches. It is even found at the bottom of the deep ocean. So just how bad is the threat from plastic pollution, and what can be done? Well, joining us today is scientist Dr Denise Hardesty, a specialist in plastic pollution and illegal fishing at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hardesty, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So, Denise, can we get started by telling us a bit more about your research into plastic pollution and the impacts that it has on ecosystems and biodiversity? Sure, I'd be happy to. Our team has been working on this topic for over a decade, and really we've been taking a risk-based approach, and so trying to understand what trash debris pollution makes its way from our hands, from the backs of trucks, from our shipgoing activities and from every other activity that you can imagine, what causes it to fall into the environment? So we try to trace the sources. Where does that debris come from? How does it move through the environment? That means understanding not only how many people live in an area or what the road networks and infrastructure are, but to try to understand, is it moving through people's littering behavior or along rivers or streams or waterways as it makes its way out to the beaches and into the ocean? And then we focus on what are those impacts that result from that litter, from that pollution on our wildlife, on our people, on our communities. So everything from seabirds and turtles and marine mammals, we've been asking questions about what are the impacts from plastic pollution on a whole suite of different marine and coastal taxa. And then finally, we focus our work on understanding those policy responses. So where we have change, what's most likely to result in demonstrable changes to how much trash is out there. Do we want to put our money and our resources to focusing on policies, on infrastructure, or on outreach campaigns and activities such as that? And we've been doing that work both in Australia and at the global scale. Yes, on the issue of you know marine animals ingesting plastic, there have been a few iconic images that have been circulating on the internet recently, whether it be the seahorse curled around the cotton bud or turtles with a plastic straw up its nose. But maybe we could zoom in on another area of concern, which is microplastics. So how do these microplastics form and why are they such a concern? So microplastics are really just a subset of plastics. Microplastics are, by common definition, anything that's five millimeters or smaller in size. And mostly they form from the breakdown of our plastic bottles and takeaway containers and cutlery and straws and all those things that we use, so many people use in our daily lives. They are also from primary products, which is becoming less common, but we have actually had microplastics by design in things like facial scrubs or toothpaste or things like that. And why are they such a concern? Well, they're really, really small. And that means that they're accessible to so many more organisms up and down the food chain. They can be eaten by anything as small as a plankton or as large as a whale. So Denise, you were recently part of a team that calculated there's about 14 million tons of microplastic waste at the bottom of the oceans. It's very hard to kind of picture what that looks like because this must be trillions and trillions of pieces of plastic. But can you tell us more about that study and and why the results were so concerning? Sure, David. So that study was really part of an integrated team of researchers and we actually used, as you might imagine, a deep sea robot, an underwater autonomous vehicle to go out there and to get those samples. Because you have to remember, we're sampling down at 3,000 meters in depth, several hundred kilometers offshore. So away from the coastline, away from where we can safely and easily get as humans. And I think the reason that that study is so confronting is that it points to not only how much there is, but just how ubiquitous the results of our daily lives are in terms of permeating all different components of the globe, you know, from the deepest depths of the sea in remote areas where we don't have lots of people or major communities. And I think that's really a bit of a wake up call to people. And what you just asked prior to that or in the beginning of that question is, well, what does that look like? 
So we estimate that that looks like somewhere around 8 to 14 plastic bags full of plastic trash for every single meter of coastline for every single continent around the world aside from Antarctica. So that might give your listeners a little bit of a visual mm. image of how much that really is. And where did all this plastic pollution, mm. or the microplastic pollution that, that you found at the bottom of the ocean, where, where did it come from? So that's a good question that we don't actually have a hard and fast answer for. In general, most of our plastics comes from land or land-based activities. Of course, it comes from industry, from agriculture, waste, and aquaculture, and you know, ship-based activities, and from all sorts of human activities on land. We, as humans, live on land, so most of our trash is generated on land. And what happens is it flows out through stormwater drains, down rivers and creeks and streams, or is dropped or lost by beachgoers, and it can sometimes end up out there in the ocean. But because the pieces that we're looking at are so tiny, so small, We can't actually look at them and say, ah, this particular piece came from this particular location per se. We wish we had that knowledge right now. We just don't have it. I guess there's there's also the concern that because these pieces are so small, small marine animals, even fish are are eating them. And of course, we eat fish and we eat seafood. So what does that mean for, for human health? So that's a question that people ask me about a lot because, you know, there's this concern that our plastic that ends up out there in the ocean can end up in a small fish that's eaten by a bigger fish that's eaten by a bigger fish that is ultimately eaten by a human. And does that mean that I, as a consumer, am am I going to be eating that plastic? Well, in general, if you're eating whole, large fish, we tend to gut the fish or to take out the digestive tract. And the digestive tract is where you would be finding that plastic. So for me, if I was going to be eating fish, I would be much more concerned about other environmental contaminants or heavy metal contamination if I was eating fish from a major urban center or something like that. Now, if someone is eating local, coastally caught, entire marine organisms, particularly if you're downstream from a water or a sewage treatment plant or something, then from mussels or clams, you may be more likely to be eating more very, very small plastics, or if you're mm. eating, you know, sardines or something like that, where you eat the entire fish. Okay. I mean, it's still concerning, I guess, but I guess we can still go out and have our Sunday brunch with fish without being too concerned, I suppose. I think you're safe to do so, at least from the plastic pollution side of things. I, you know, it's always good to know where your fish is coming from and has it been caught sustainably or those sorts of things, if that's in alignment with your values. You know, mm. th- I think those are really choices for each and every listener to make mm. based upon what's important to them. But I personally wouldn't worry about eating microplastics as a result of eating fish. Mm. Okay. Now, if you like what you're hearing so far, do subscribe to our series Green Pulse on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or even Spotify and like and give us a rating. Now, back to our conversation with Dr. Denise Hardesty on why the threat from plastic pollution is everyone's problem. So, Denise, I just wanted to follow up on, you know, what happens to all the plastic when it enters the ocean from land. So, do they all go to the ocean floor or where else do plastics end up in the ocean? Yeah, Audrey, that's a really good question and one that people ask about. So if we have between 4 and 12 or, you know, 8.5 million tons of plastic entering the ocean each year, where does it go? So some of it is estimated to be floating on the ocean surface. And what we found on the seabed floor, if you extrapolate from where we surveyed and what the previous estimates have been, we found around 35 to 50 times more plastic on the seabed floor than is floating on the ocean surface. However, I think the heartening part of the story is that most of our trash or plastic actually ends up back on our beaches and on our shorelines. And yes, those plastic particles that are heavier than seawater, those ones that sink rather than float, are much more likely to be locally located from where they were lost into the environment, right? Because if something sinks... By definition, it's not going to travel as far versus something that floats is going to travel further. But some of our previous research has really shown that our trash is mostly ending up on our beaches, on our coastline, in that backshore vegetation where it gets trapped from onshore winds and waves and currents driving things on land. And I say that's, in a sense, a happy story 
because it's a lot easier, more successful, more cost effective, and likely to succeed for us to clean up our trash closer to source rather than trying to clean it up out there in the ocean where it's in small little bitty bits in the deep depths of the ocean. So hopefully that gives people rather than cause for alarm, a little bit of hope and optimism about how we can manage things better on land. Yes, here in Singapore, we've also seen a lot of uh, marine conservation groups going out to our shores to pick up trash, and it really depends on the monsoon season, which which beaches they target. But you know, while a lot of plastic ends up back on land where it's accessible for us humans to pick up after ourselves, do you think that every year, more and more plastic is still accumulating in the ocean? Well, I don't only think that the evidence really shows that and suggests that. So we did some work that we published a year ago where we actually demonstrated that not only is there plastic in the ocean, but it is increasing through time. And it seems to be tracking how much we're making each year in a cumulative basis. And right now it's estimated that the amount of plastic doubles every 10 to 11 years, which means that between now and 2020 and in the next decade, we will make more plastic than has been made since plastic production began in the 1950s. So yes, it is good that it's, it's, or it's not good, it's better that it's on land than out in the middle of the ocean. However, yes, we're still seeing more plastic entering our coastal areas and entering our global ocean each and every year. I mean, that's still quite a frightening, right? Because it, it, sort of, it sort of paints a picture of coastlines more and more sort of covered in plastic waste, right? It would be like everybody's sort of out there all the time picking up all their plastic rubbish, which sort of brings us to the question that pretty much daily you see the damage that so much plastic waste is causing. So what are the solutions to prevent an even worse crisis? Well, I think the solutions are numerous and varied. And I think it's really important that we have local solutions to address the problem and that we involve not just individual citizens and not just governments. You know, We also need to be working with industry partners. So it's going to take a whole suite of solutions and a whole global community, You know, starting at that local level, to invoke those changes. So I think we really want to be start thinking about what I call a legacy mindset as we design products. We need to think about what's their next life going to be? And do we really need or do we really want to support so many of the single use products that are basically made, used and discarded? And so I think it's really going to be looking at solutions up and down the supply chain. So it's not just management and infrastructure at the end of life. It's actually, what are the new materials we're going to make things with? You know, we need to be mindful of the unintended consequences that may come from those, some of those sorts of things. But, you know, we want to be looking at design from that more circular mindset. So if I'm going to make this cup, what can it be turned into? And at the same time, we need to be mindful of the real importance for having food safety and food security and appropriate transportation to get our products to places so that people around the world have safe and clean food and drinking water and those sorts of things. And I really do think, though, that we have lots of opportunities for creating new businesses. And we're seeing lots of those things spring up in places all over the world where we're turning fishing nets into socks or bathing suits or skateboards or sunglasses. We're looking at alternative products to use for packaging from everything from seaweed or biofilms or things like that. So I think that there are lots of opportunities out there and it's going to be an exciting time to see what the creative ones amongst us can help create to help support us in shifting away from plastics and hopefully by putting a price on plastics and actually treating plastics as a commodity rather than waste, we can really shift the game on this one. So Denise, you just mentioned the importance of engaging industry and of course, you know, the big brands that we all know, drinks manufacturers and personal care manufacturers, I mean they're they're key to this solution. So what signs are you seeing, you know, in your engagement with them or you know, just in general, are they working hard to come up with solutions in terms of different types of materials to put in a drink container or shampoo bottles, or are those solutions just not ready yet? Well, I think there's a couple of main shifts that we are seeing, and as those, one of the first of those is that there is now um, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which is a group of industry partners, many of the multinationals that have put some funds together to 
help start resolving this crisis in a sustained, integrated, committed fashion. And so they have a whole suite or series of different projects in different countries around the world where they're aiming to support or develop pilot cases for some solutions. So that is one thing that's happening in that broader space. So one of the other big game changers that we've seen is an announcement from PepsiCo and Coca-Cola in support of putting an actual price or tax or levy on plastics. And if you can treat plastics as a commodity rather than waste, then we will see a fundamental shift in our relationship with plastics. And we know that market-based instruments, such as you know, fees or fines or incentives have historically shown to be very, very successful. And there's a long-standing program in South Africa, for example, where we've seen businesses created that are economically viable that use recycled material and where there's been a voluntary participation from industry to help keep the floor up on the price on plastic. So rather than raising it really high, what we really need to have waste pickers and those critical frontline workers making sure that our waste isn't lost into the environment is for them to have a value proposition. And so that putting a price on plastics is really about making sure that there's stability in the market so that we can have those supply chains remain consistent. Thank you, Denise, for sharing with us more about your research and the possible solutions that we could have looking forward. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be with you and to talk to you about this work. For more on climate change and the environment, do check out the stories in The Streets Times. That's a wrap for Green Pulse and we hope you enjoyed our discussion. That was an SPH podcast by The Straits Times. Find us on Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts or streaming on Google Home. Do feedback to us at podcast.sph.com.sg. You can also check out more podcasts on various topics at The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3.